Hello, my name is Scott Harp. I'm one of the physician assistants here at HealthWorks Medical. We're going to talk today about uh, dermatology. Uh, dermatology is the uh, branch of medicine that deals with both the uh, function and the structure of skin. So we're going to talk in depth about that today. Uh, why is it necessary to understand dermatology? We're uh, going to talk about the four different areas, uh, skin cancers, uh, different infections, um, body temperature regulation, as well as uh, uh, pain caused by skin lesions, and just general appearance uh, type things from skin lesions. Uh, overview topics, uh, just kind of the order that we're going to follow, or we're going to look at the anatomy or the structure of the skin, uh, the physiology, which is the function of, and uh, different disorders, uh, uh, boils, skin cancer, those type things. We're also going to talk about uh, different treatments and uh, different skin lesions and damage caused by sun exposure. Uh, the anatomy skin layers, we're just going to talk about the anatomy first. The first layer is your epidermis. It's the outermost layer of skin that sheds off. Uh, you uh, have a thickness of what it says here, very thin on your eyelid, 0 0.5 millimeters or 0 0.05 millimeters, and uh, gets thicker in your palms and the soles of your feet to 1.5 millimeters. Uh, it allows you to uh, have a little bit tougher surface on the palms and soles of your feet and it sheds about every two weeks, a complete cycle about every two weeks. Um, uh, also the, the second layer is a dermis. It's a uh, layer that contains some of the vascular structures uh, that have to deal with sensation. It also has to deal with the strength and uh, elasticity as well. Uh, the third layer is your subcutaneous layer, your fatty layer. Uh, it prov provides some insulation as well as a shock absorber type function as well. Uh, this is just kind of a drawing of uh, your skin layers. The very top slide there just kind of depicts your uh, epidermal layer. It's uh, got some lipids and it's uh, held together by little rivets that are uh, proteins. Um, and this is just the outermost layer and it uh, is kind of depicted in this uh, region right through here and it uh, just provides a, a barrier that uh, keeps things out, uh, water and uh, temperature and that type of thing, but also uh, holds things in that need to be held in as well. Um, it's a barrier against different things, uh, uh, bac bacteria and, aller and uh, allergens uh, as well. Um, the uh, at the very bottom of the epidermis is your uh, basal lamina, and it uh, selectively filters uh, uh, different molecules going from one surface to the next. Um, let's see, we'll go to the next one there. Let's see. Uh, the thickest layer is your dermal layer. It's the very bottom here. We talked about the epidermal layer initially, then your second layer is this dermal layer. Uh, and it has uh, con connective tissue in there, and uh, it's a little bit thicker than what you'll see in the epidermal layer, and it uh, houses some structures in there that we'll talk about as well. It's uh, composed of uh, collagen, which helps with the elasticity. It uh, uh, has some degree of very small blood vessels, small nerves, hair follicles, and sweat glands. Uh, this is your uh, subcutaneous layer. It's the, you, you see it uh, in the yellow globular looking areas there. If you happen to get a uh, laceration of your skin and you see yellow globular type tissue, that's your subcutaneous layer and that's usually an indication that you need to uh, close uh, skin if it's uh, cut to the subcutaneous layer. So your subcutaneous layer, uh, it uh, also has uh, sweat glands and hair follicles that extend down into that area. And as we talked about earlier, it um, is, uh, acts as an uh, insulator and a shock absorber as well. And uh, it's your fatty layer and it also stores energy. Uh, this is just a slide depicting your uh, sweat glands and your um, different types of uh, sweat glands. Some come out just right at your skin level there and others come out in areas that are associated with a hair follicle. So you have uh, two different areas that, where your sweat glands will exit out into your skin. Um, 
different types of skin cells, your melanocytes, they produce melanin, and uh, they don't have many melanocytes in your uh, soles or your palms. Uh, that's why you don't get sunburned or suntanned on your palms or your uh, soles or your feet. Uh, albinos uh, lack an enzyme that uh, help with this melanin, and uh, they're not able to produce any type of skin tone. Um, cancer, as you well know, of the melanocytes is uh, known as a melanoma. Um, go past this one here. Let's go another one there. Uh, other area of skin and dermatology that you might not be aware of is uh, is your fingernails. Both your uh, toenails, fingernails, any of the hard plate-like structures that you have there helps provide a protective covering from your fingers and the endpoints of your digits. And um, uh, once you get a nail plate injured or it comes off, if it has an infection from a fungal infection, it can take four to six months to fully regenerate. And it usually uh, regenerates kind of from the uh, bottom layer up. Um, pass that. Uh, sebaceous glands are basically just sweat glands that uh, are attached to hair follicles at times. You can see the sweat gland here, how it kind of connects into your hair follicles. And uh, sometimes you can get infections in these areas where these sweat glands will get plugged up and will cause an infection uh, that you see that rises up like a little pustule or a little bump above the skin. <clears throat> uh, function of the skin, uh, one of the big ones is sensation, being able to tell uh, if you have uh, heat or cold, your body's able to sense that. It's a problem for diabetics that don't have good sensory function in their skin if they go out and walk on a hot summer day across a, uh, a driveway and don't realize that it's hot, it can scorch their feet and blister their feet and they may not know it because they don't have proper uh, sensation in their skin just because of uh, nerve damage caused by diabetes. Uh, the other thing that the skin does is provides an immune function. Uh, it's a barrier that keeps the bacteria out but also houses some good bacteria that you need uh, to help fight off the bad bacteria. Um, and also your thermoregulation with skin, uh, as you know, as you get hotter, you sweat, and uh, also your blood vessels dilate out to let heat radiate off, and the combination of the dil dilatation of your blood vessels as well as uh, sweat helps the uh, heat to radiate off. People that get into problems with heat stroke and uh, heat stress uh, at some point will lose uh, or have difficulty with the thermoregulation. And, um, uh, not be sweating any longer, and that's kind of when you get into trouble when you have significant heat stress. Um, also, another important function of skin is absorption. A lot of a lot of uh, practitioners are going now to different topical gels that you can use, like testosterone gels or topicals for uh, pain relief with anti-inflammatory type medicine, because your skin will do a good job with absorption, and uh, you can. Uh, kind of avoid the systemic effects of taking oral um, anti-inflammatory medicines and avoid uh, difficulties with irritating your stomach and other type of things that you can get with just the uh, absorption of medication. So uh, a cutaneous absorption or skin absorption is a good way that uh, we found over the past several years that is working real well for uh, pain control in some areas. Uh, going on further here into the immune function of the skin, uh, it's known as the largest organ in the body. Uh, it, again, provides a pretty powerful barrier. Um, it uh, uh, also keeps a slightly acidic uh, environment that uh, keeps the bad bacteria off. Uh, your skin is normally inhabited with uh, staph uh, bacterium, and a good healthy um, level of staph is needed to fight off the bad bacteria that can get in there and cause uh, infections. And we'll talk more about that with uh, MRSA infections and other infections that we see commonly that cause problems. Um, one of the big things we see at, uh, in outpatient clinics and emergency rooms and health works uh, clinics as well are uh, abscesses and boils. And we're going to talk a little bit about what they are, how you treat them, how you identify them, and when you should be concerned about them. Uh, most boils, as it says here, are caused by staph bacteria. And as I said earlier, we have normal staph on our body that uh, is normal, but if one of these sweat glands gets plugged up and we have an overgrowth of staph, then it can cause an infectious uh, type problem. Your skin will turn red, you'll develop a whitehead pustule type area, uh, and this can occur through any nick in the skin or just a hair follicle that gets infected. Um, 
can become colonized with an excess amount of the staph uh, that can cause infections. Um, these people in particular uh, have uh, uh, problems with skin infections. We see it a lot in people with immune system dysfunction, those people that are on chemotherapy or people that, are on, that have other disorders that are taking immune suppressive medicines that uh, don't require their body to, or that don't allow their body to respond normally uh, to fight off infection. That's one area. The other area is diabetes with people that don't have good blood sugar control. Their immune system doesn't function optimally and they have difficulty fighting off infection. Uh, other areas are uh, poor nutrition, uh, people uh, that uh, don't have proper nutrition or are not able to manufacture the things needed uh, to take care of infections, and then uh, obviously poor hygiene lends itself to overgrowth of bacteria too just because of the um, condition that your skin is in and when it's not being cleansed. This is a big problem in third world countries where they don't have uh, proper hygiene, and they have all types of infection issues that are caused just by simple hygiene things that aren't uh, followed. Um, also other things, uh, exposure to harsh chemicals that irritate your skin, people that work around concrete and other chemicals a lot will have lots of difficulties with uh, skin problems and irritations uh, just because it's uh, something your uh, body's not used to. Uh, we mentioned this earlier, the MRSA infections that uh, you see a lot, they call it the superbug infection and why it's so common. 20 years ago you only saw these type of infections in uh, nursing homes and uh, healthcare facilities. But uh, over the past 15 years, you're starting to see this out more in the community. Um, these are uh, staph type bugs that become resistant to certain type of antibiotic. And in this case, it's called MRSA, uh, methicillin resistant staph aureus that uh, uh, becomes a resistant, uh, resistant infection to, most an to, to several antibiotics. Uh, it's resistant to the ones that you most commonly use for skin, so you have to be aware of that and uh, treat appropriately if you feel like uh, these people are candidates for uh, MRSA type infection. Um, this is just a slide that goes over when to seek medical care. Uh, anytime you have a question, always contact your supervisor or uh, contact us at HealthWorks. You can just call the main uh, number there and it will put you through to somebody that's on call if it's after hours. If it's during hours, just come by. We'll be glad to take a look at it, see if it's anything that's concerning. Um, general areas or general concerns that you should have is if you start running a fever, if you have swollen lymph nodes. Our body has a system of, uh, it's called the lymphatic system that helps you uh, to fight off infection. You have a lymph node chain in the front part of your neck, under your arms, and in your groins uh, that are real prominent that if you have infections in those areas, you'll have swollen uh, glands in those areas as well. If you start having swollen lymph nodes associated with infection, we need to know about that also. Um, just if you have general redness around the area of the ball, which would be expected, but if you start having streaks that come off of it, little linear streaks that kind of go up, we'll need to know about that as well, as that could be an indication of the infection moving or spreading. Uh, if the pain becomes significant, uh, that's an indication that it probably needs to be treated with antibiotics or it needs to be lanced and opened up. Um, or if a secondary boil occurs, sometimes you can have a track that occurs between two areas and uh, if you have another boil that occurs in a close proximity, it might need to be opened up and drained. Uh, boil treatments, just common things that you can do at home. Uh, if it doesn't get to the point where you're having streaking or significant lymph node enlargement or temperature, uh, you can uh, just apply warm moist compress to the area and uh, sometimes that'll help with pain and it'll also help bring some of the infection to the surface. And once that comes to a whitehead and starts to drain some, then it usually does pretty well without antibiotics. Um, uh, and the bottom part of this slide just kind of indicates that uh, once this thing starts draining, it usually does pretty well and just washing it with uh, soap and water and antibiotic ointment, you might be able to get by with just doing that. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, just with any concerns, notify your supervisor or contact us here at HealthWorks and we'll be glad to uh, take a look at it or, or talk to you over the phone and give you some advice on what needs to be done. Um, we're just going to talk about uh, different, uh, a few different areas of different skin lesions, um, some that are equal to the plane of skin, some that are above and some that are below the skin surface. And we'll just look at a couple of those quickly here. Um, this just kind of indicates a, a uh, skin lesion that is equal to the plane of skin, or if you were to rub your hand over the top of that, you wouldn't be able to feel it, but you could see it. Um, this is one, it's called a telangiectasia, and it's just below 
the surface of the skin. It's a spider vein. That if you were to run your hand over that, you wouldn't be able to feel it, but you can see it. It's a benign process. It's usually caused by varicose veins. Uh, this is a petechial type uh, rash that you can get uh, from different uh, disorders. Um, sometimes you can get it by a forceful cough or vomit. Little kids will get this sometimes in their eyes, or, or not in their eyes, but on their face there uh, after they've had coughing episodes or they vomited. It's usually not a concern, but if it's diffuse or if it's in multiple areas of the body, we need to look at it. Uh, these are other skin lesions, uh, basically just bruising there that uh, you wouldn't necessarily be able to tell. You can just run your hand over and you wouldn't be able to feel it necessarily. Um, but these are what they call ecchymosis or purpura. Uh, that, um, one of them is a vascular type lesion, the other one is just a, a bruise. Um, now we're moving to the skin lesions that are above the plane of the skin. These would be things that you could run your hand over and you could feel them actually. Uh, the one on the left here is actinic keratosis. You feel like a little, um, a little firm, like horn type thing that you can get on the top of your head or on any sun exposed surface that uh, needs to be frozen off. It's a benign, well, it can be a precancerous type lesion, but uh, they can be frozen off and usually don't cause you much problem. Uh, the one over on the right side is uh, uh, somebody's heel there, and it's just uh, what they call hyperkeratosis, or it's basically just an overproduction of your epidermal skin and it's, there's no problems with that. You can usually just moisturize that and it'll go away. Um, other areas, uh, other skin lesions above the plane of the skin are the calluses, which everybody's seen, that occurs more on the bottom surface of your foot, and then corns are, are basically a callus, but it's on the top of your foot that you could run your hand over and you could feel those. Um, these are some other uh, lesions also. Papules are basically just little, um, uh, nodular type lesions that uh, this one is depicted in the area on the lip but it's probably like a fever blister type thing that you can that you could feel all right and these are just uh, the one on the left is uh, what they call urticaria it's a little wheel that you can get from an allergic type rash and the one on the right is something you see with psoriasis you have it on the extensor areas of your skin like your elbows and knees and uh, those are kind of scaly looking areas that uh, can sometimes be associated with psoriasis. Um, the last one here is just some blistering. You get this with sunburns or just general burns. You can get it with a chemical burn as well. It's just a clear uh, blister and sometimes you can have these associated with shingles also. All right. It's called a vesicle, uh, better known as a blister. And these areas, uh, the one on the right upper is a pustule, which is basically like a pimple. It comes to a head like that, and then it usually drains shortly thereafter because the pus is about to come out of the skin. And the one here on the bottom is a cyst, like a ganglion cyst. This is a wrist with a ganglion cyst there that needs to either be aspirated or drained, or it can be surgically excised. These are just some warts. And let's see, this is just an area of scratching called excoriation. Uh, now these are skin lesions below the plane of the skin. Ulcerations, people have uh, uh, ulcers from different wounds and it erodes down into the different layers. You can see it's gone down from the uh, epidermal layer down into the dermal layer. It hasn't extended down to the subcutaneous layer, but it's eroded down into the skin. Uh, this is another uh, fissure. People get these a lot in the corner of their mouths, uh, little fissures where the skin basically just breaks. And uh, this is a heel. It's called eschar. It's basically just a really thick scab looking area that you have to debride that off there and get to the healthy tissue underneath there to get that to heal properly. And that's just from a wound that probably hasn't been taken care of very well. You might, these are things that you see in diabetics that might go out and walk on a, on a hot day and not realize it and get some blistering, get a burn. They don't take care of it and they come in with something that looks like this that has to have some pretty aggressive wound care. Uh, last part here is skin cancers. We're just going to talk briefly about that. Um, three types of skin cancers we're going to talk about are basal cell, squamous cell, and melanoma. Basal cell and squamous cell are not as aggressive as melanomas. Melanomas are pretty uh, well known to be aggressive and to metastasize, which means to spread to other areas of your body. So we'll talk about those three lesions, how you identify them, what you need to do about them. A melanoma, as we talked earlier, is just basically your melanocytes in your skin. As they get sun exposure, they'll produce melanin and, they'll get, and you'll get darker. Uh, when this goes wrong is when this melanocyte 
uh, grows kind of out of control and it, it reproduces too rapidly and it uh, can turn into a melanoma, which is the skin cancer that, if it's not treated aggressively, can spread to other organs and be a significant problem. This is a picture of a melanoma, and uh, we'll talk about later how you identify these. It, uh, it has irregular borders there, and it has varying colors throughout. It has a very dark area, more light, darker over here. It's not symmetric. So if you drew a line down the middle of this, the right side doesn't look the same as the left. So it has an asymmetric appearance. It's irregular. It has varying colors. And usually these that become concerned are bigger than the eraser on a pencil. So we'll talk about that in a minute. But we... Uh, when we do your general physical exam, we try to look and do just kind of a screening also of your skin to make sure you don't have any problematic moles. Um, this is actinic keratosis that we talked about earlier. It's just, it feels like a little rough spot on your skin. It usually doesn't cause much problem. You can usually have these frozen off, but if you have any area in your skin that feels really crusty and that doesn't go away over a uh, three or four month time span, we probably need to look at it and get that frozen off. Um, uh, basal cell and squamous cell carcinomas, these are ones that are more aggressive than an actinic keratosis, but not quite as aggressive as a melanoma. Uh, but uh, here again, the key is, is that if you have any skin lesion that doesn't seem to be healing over a three month, two to three month time frame, it seems to just be persisting and not getting better, then we probably need to look at it to see if it's something that could be concerning for a skin cancer. Um, these are just some different uh, rates of melanoma, which we talked about as one of the uh, most aggressive forms of skin cancer. And you can see us uh, down in the purchase region here. We have a pretty high rate of melanoma here, and Lake Cumberland area has a pretty high rate of melanoma also. It may just be because people in this region may get more sun exposure. Not sure why, but this is a graph done by the uh, uh, Kentucky uh, Cancer Society and uh, just kind of showing the rates of melanoma in the different regions of Kentucky here. And we seem to live in a pretty high region here, pretty high incidence of melanoma. Uh, we briefly talked about earlier when we had the melanoma picture up here of how to identify this. So there's a real easy mnemonic, A, B, C, D, the asymmetry. If it looks different on one side or the other, if you can draw a line in the middle of it and the right side looks different than the left, then it's asymmetric. If the borders are irregular, that's concerning. If the color varies throughout, and if the diameter is bigger than an eraser on a pencil, then that's concerning as well. And here again is another melanoma. And it has varying colors. It's really light here, a little bit darker there, very dark here. It's irregular. It doesn't look the same on the bottom half as it does the top. And if you were to look at the actual size of this, it would be sizable. And uh, it seems to be changing some as time goes on. Some of these on the back you may not be able to see as well. Um, this is just another picture of either a basal, swell, bas basal cell or squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, and here again, the key is if it's changing over, or if it's not changing over two to three month time frame, is persistent, just doesn't seem like it would go away, we probably need to look at it. This is another actinic keratosis or just a real crusty uh, lesion that you feel. It just needs to be frozen off. And these are some risk factors for skin cancer. Uh, people with lighter skin that tend to burn very easily have a high rate of skin cancer. If you have family history of skin cancer, you're a little bit more predisposed to develop that. Uh, if you have a personal history also, you're more likely to get more. And uh, ex exposure to the sun uh, through work and play. If you work in a construction area or some area where you have high sun exposure, you're obviously at higher risk to get skin cancer. So, uh, And then history of multiple sunburns early in life sets you up later in life for uh, developing skin cancer. So, Sunscreen and uh, protection, wearing hats and uh, long sleeve shirts and things like that are a key to helping with that. Uh, other risk factors are people that have multiple freckles or they uh, uh, turn red very easily. Um, can be people that are set up for having skin cancers. Uh, people that have blue-green eyes tend to uh, burn easier and tend to have more skin cancers than uh, brown-eyed people. Um, different hair types, blonde, red hair turn to... Uh, burn easier and have more rates of skin cancer. And uh, then people that have large uh, numbers of moles also because they're harder to detect. And you just have to see if they're changing in shape and color. Uh, just common sense type things, just to seek shade, try to avoid uh, heavy sun exposure times between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. Uh, cover up, as we alluded to earlier, wear hats 
just other kind of common sense uh, type things. Uh, sunglasses also are helpful just to kind of prevent UV rays from uh, sun exposure and giving you any kind of uh, problem with your eyes as well. And uh, recommending uh, sunscreen uh, 15 or higher that uh, has both UVA and UVB uh, protection. Uh, SPF, what does that mean? It's the sunburn protection factor. So uh, it's the amount of protection from a UVB rays. It doesn't really measure UVA protection. However, the FDA is coming out with new standards uh, for sunscreen. They'll have both UVB, UVB and UVBA uh, listed on those. Uh, 15, 30, and 45 uh, are the different ones that we're using. And uh, 45 seems to give you better coverage than the 15. Um, we talked about the SPF already here um, and the ratios of um, uh, sun exposure to sunburn and uh, sunburn in 30 minutes protected and sunburn in uh, one minute unprotected is your SPF of 30 there at the bottom. All right, about done here. Um, just talks about correct quantities of sunscreen application. Uh, for the body, it's talking about approximately 30 milliliters or about the size of one ounce or what's, what you would see in a shot glass. And the face is about a half of a bottle cap. Uh, and uh, reapplying every two hours is something that we don't do very, very well. But just reapplication uh, is key every couple hours to really preventing sun damage. Um, Long-term effects of the UV rays, uh, epidermal thickening. You've probably seen people as they get older, they have very thick, leathery type skin. That's just from repeat sun exposure. They haven't done a very good job with uh, sun protection. And then they also can have uh, visible signs of photoaging. This is a picture of the back of my hand. I've got, on my right hand, I've got an area that just showed up over the, maybe not be able to see it too well, but right there, an area that just showed up in the past year or two, and it's just as effective of just not using good sunscreen and having some photoaging of your skin. Um, key to skin cancer detection is uh, just self-exams uh, monthly, just having somebody glance over things on your back that you can't see, make sure nothing's changing, and then we'll do it through your yearly exams here at HealthWorks. Um, that's just talking about the new grading scales that are coming for the uh, SFP and the PFA. They're measuring both UVA and UVB, but that's something that's coming down the pike from the FDA on how to measure your protection factors a little bit better. This is the last slide here, and it just kind of depicts a uh, hand of somebody that's older. They've got lots of sunspots and sun changes there versus a uh, baby that hasn't had any sun exposure at all. You can just see the disparity between the two there. So that's our talk on dermatology today. Uh, thank you.